This was a shock for me, just as it is for anyone who discovers that their cherished partner isn't exclusively theirs. Like many others who find out this way, I stumbled upon it by chance. I was in Chicago, having just sealed a deal that would elevate me to regional director. I reached out to an old friend from school who lived in the Chicago area and whom I hadn't seen in years. We talked frequently on the phone but hadn't met in person for a decade. I invited him for a drink, and he was happy to join me. I was at the Hilton Hotel bar, working on a list when Barry showed up. As I stood to greet him and give him a hug, the list fell to the floor. Barry picked it up and noticed it was a list of women's names. What's this, you old rascal? A list of charming ladies you plan to call for tonight's party? Not quite. When I return to Denver, I'll be moving into the regional director's office and need to choose a personal assistant from these finalists. They're all qualified, and I'm struggling to find a distinguishing factor. Barry took a seat on the barstool next to me and asked, What are they like in bed? What kind of question is that? I asked. Have you ever had a deal that could use a little extra incentive? I'm not following you. Three months ago, we were working on a deal for the procurement of a whole batch of machine parts. Three companies competed for the contract, and all had approximately the same requirements in terms of price, quality, delivery time, and the like. I was a junior member of the team, and although my input was required, Cal and John had to make a decision. The guy from Martin asked what it would take to get the contract. Cal replied, a night with your personal assistant. Cal was joking when he said it, but the Martin guy said he'd do it. Cal looked at John, who nodded in agreement, and Cal said, Do this and you will have a contract. This happened. Oh my God, hasn't this ever happened before? She was a real beauty in her early forties. They stayed here for two days, and she invited us all. Even though I was married, I would run away with her in a heartbeat. Are you saying Martin? I know a couple of people at Martin's. Do you remember their names? Maybe I know her. His name was Dale, and her name was Sandy. I remember this because whenever she was introduced to someone, she would say, I'm Sandy. My joy at meeting Barry after so many years of work had subsided somewhat. My wife, Sandy, worked at Martin's and was Dale Hartman's personal assistant. Barry and I had a few drinks together, then we had dinner and talked about old times. But I was thinking about what he told me. Sandy took Dale on one or two trips a month. Did she sleep with anyone for contracts during all these visits? She had worked at Martin's for almost twenty years, and for the last ten of those years, she had been Dale's assistant. Lord, how many questions this raised. When did she start cheating on me? Did she start after she went to work for Martin or before that? Thank God we didn't have children. At least they wouldn't have to decide who their father might be. After dinner, we had another drink and parted, promising to maintain a closer relationship. I spent the night in my hotel room wondering if Sandy slept alone while I was gone. On the way home, I was thinking about what to do. Ignore it. Sandy and I had what I thought was a good marriage. She was very loving and gentle towards me. Our personal life was wonderful. At least, that's what I thought. Should I ignore what I learned from Barry and act on the principle, my life is great, so it's not worth doing anything to change it? Even when I thought about it, I knew I wouldn't go down that path. Divorce? Did I really want to be single again at 45? I thought about all the women I knew between the ages of 40 and 45. This would be the social circle I would fish with if I was single. And I didn't like any of them. They were all elderly ladies. Sure, Sandy was 44, but she looked 35. Just like Barry said, she was hot. Can a single 45-year-old guy attract young, pretty girls? I didn't think so. I was in good shape, I had all my hair and teeth, and Doris, my secretary, always told me that she would leave her husband and run away with me in a heartbeat. But I knew it was just office flirting. She was in love with her husband and it was impossible to separate her from him and her three children, even with the help of dynamite. I realized that I was wasting my time thinking about what to do. 
I knew myself and knew that all I was going to do was go for it and let the chips fall where they may. After landing in Denver, I stopped by the office, completed paperwork, and received congratulations from my boss. He asked me if I had already chosen my assistant, to which I replied that I had not and that I was having trouble narrowing down the list. He laughed and said, do as I do. I put all their names in a hat and pulled out one of them. Since then, Patty has been with me, and I have never regretted it. I thought for a second or so and then said, I'll do that. I'll tell you the name tomorrow. Then I went home to meet Sandy. I returned home an hour before her and refreshed myself with a couple of cocktails diluted with water. I was sitting at the kitchen table when Sandy came in. She smiled, came up to me, leaned over, and kissed me. Then she asked, How's your trip? Fruitful? I signed a contract with Apex and will be moving to the regional director's office starting tomorrow. I'm happy for you, dear. I know how hard you worked. What's next? I need to choose a personal assistant from six candidates. They all seem well prepared, and I'm having a hard time deciding. You are a personal assistant, so what should I pay attention to? The one who knows how to lead. The one who gets her ass kicked and loves sex. Sai's face turned pale, and her voice became cold as she asked, What is this question you're asking me? I just wanted your opinion on what I should focus on. I mean, you're a personal assistant, and you have experience with all this. What do you mean, Robert? I had dinner with an old friend when I was in Chicago, Barry Watson. Does the name sound familiar to you? No? Should it? I think it's reasonable that you should at least know the names of the men you sleep with. It's not funny, Robert. I know. I wasn't laughing either when Barry told me about Dale and Sandy from Martins who came to town to convince Barry's company to sign a contract. Do you remember Cal and John, or did you forget their names too? I have no idea what you're talking about, Robert, and I don't like what you're implying at all. Stop it. Sandy, you're caught unless you can somehow prove to me that there is another Dale who works for Martin, who also has an assistant named Sandy, and who was in Chicago three months ago to sign a contract with Amalgamated. You're screwed. Barry even remembered your little quirk, you know, how you tell everyone you meet that your name is Sandy with an I. What I want to know is how long this has been going on. She must have finally realized the conversation was over and sat down opposite me. Actually, it was more like she collapsed into the chair opposite me. Yes, I really did this with the guys from Amalgamated, but it wasn't to force them to sign anything. They had already agreed to sign, and we were celebrating. Things got out of hand. So you're saying you've never had sex before or after this? She looked away and said, Not really. What the hell does not really mean? Since then, Dale and I have had something of an affair. Something like a novel. What the hell does that mean? I've been seeing him from time to time since we returned from Chicago. Well, isn't that lovely? This is unreal, I said getting up from my chair and leaving the kitchen to head to the garage to work on my current project, a 1993 Mustang convertible with a 5 engine and 5 speeds. It was broken, and I bought it for next to nothing. It needed both front fenders, the hood, and the front bumper. Even before the accident, it had been poorly maintained, the white leather seats were cracked, and the top was in poor condition. I found fenders at the market but was still looking for a hood and front bumper. I was bolting on the right fender when Sandy showed up. She leaned against the door frame and asked, What are you going to do? I do not know yet. Divorce is the right decision, but I haven't decided on the rest. The rest? Should I sue Martin Company for allowing one of its managers to have a relationship with a subordinate? Should I sue Dale for molestation? If I sue the company, you'd probably both be fired. If I don't sue Martin and instead sue Dale, it will soon become public knowledge, and you could still be fired. Couple that with the fact that our salaries are practically equal, and if you were still working, I wouldn't have to pay child support. Like I said, I'm undecided. Should divorce be inevitable, what should I say? I don't mind you cheating. Should I go to Dale and thank him for cuckolding me? Of course, there will be a divorce. 
everything was wrong. I wasn't going to do anything. I thought I was safe with Dale. I worked with him for ten years, and he never harassed me, so I trusted him. I thought he would cover for me so I had more fun than I should have. I got carried away, and they took advantage of it. The next day, I felt ashamed of what I had done, and when the guys wanted to continue, I told them to go to hell. Then Cal showed me the pictures he took on his cell phone and told me I was going to have some more fun, or the pictures would be published. I couldn't let that happen, so I decided to have fun. So you have these photographs hanging over your head? No, at least I don't think so. When it was over, Cal handed me his cell phone and asked me to delete them. He could have downloaded them, but I don't think he did. I find it hard to believe that you could have done what Barry said so easily if you hadn't done this kind of thing before. I've never done this before, and it's the honest truth. We spent a day and a half with the amalgamated guys trying to convince them to sign with us. When they did, Dale said we'd have dinner and drinks to celebrate. He invited three employees to join us, and they agreed. We went to a restaurant on the other side of town, and since neither Dale nor I drive when we're drunk, Dale arranged a limousine for us. We went to a restaurant and then talked over dinner. I wasn't very attentive, and the guys kept refilling my glass. You know how a lot of wine affects me. Indeed, I do. You may not believe me, but I really love you, Sandy. I love you, and you know it. Every day I pray that we are together. I screwed up, and I admit it, but I have never once given my feelings to someone else. I don't want a divorce, honey. I may have my flaws, but I am still yours, heart, body, and soul. Please don't let my weakness ruin what has been between us for over twenty years. I'll do anything, Bob, anything, to remain your wife. I don't know, Sandy. You're asking a lot from me, and I'm not sure I can give it. You failed me, Sandy, and I'm not sure I can trust you never to do that again. I swear, Bob, never again. Yes, Sandy, you say it now, but how do I know what you mean? The trust is gone, Sandy, and it will never come back. You planted seeds of mistrust in my mind, and those seeds will remain there forever. Even if I somehow convince myself to stay with you, these seeds will remind me of what you did. A weekend in Chicago isn't just that. Three months spent with Dale after that weekend, I'm going to believe you never brought Dale into this house or into our bed. So I'm not going to do anything drastic like burn the bed, but I will sleep in it alone. You need to move your things to one of the spare bedrooms until I decide what I'm going to do. Please, Bob, don't do this. Let me prove to you that I love you and want to stay with you. Let me make amends. How? Just put your things away, Sandy, and try to stay out of my way for a while. I got up and walked out of the garage. When she started crying, I wanted to hug her and comfort her, but I couldn't. I had to stay strong, and that's why I left. I set up one of the bedrooms as a home office and workroom. Sandy called it my man cave. I walked in and closed the door. I sat down at my computer, opened favorites, and clicked on accounts. I chose a bank and checked our accounts. There were four of them, and Sandy didn't have access to one of them. So I left the other three and transferred most of the funds to an account that Sandy couldn't use. I didn't believe I could hold Sandy, and I knew her well enough to know what she would likely do if she believed I was going to kick her to the curb. In the morning, I would deal with credit cards. I reconsidered and transferred back into my general checking account enough to cover my monthly bills. When I finished, I sat and looked at the screensaver, thinking about what Sandy had done. It amazed me that she thought she could do what she did and that I would accept it. If only she had told me about Chicago, we might have worked things out. But an affair, God, what a mess. I spent another half hour in the office and then went to the kitchen to make myself something to eat. Sandy wasn't downstairs so. I assumed she was upstairs moving her things. I watched TV and went to bed around 9. Sandy was sitting on the bed, and when I entered the room, she said, Please, Bob, don't make me leave. Leave, Sandy. Don't make me pick you up and carry you to your new room. At least you would have hugged me. 
get out of here, Sandy, and stay away from me. If you need support, call Dale, after all, he was the one who took care of your needs. She stood up and left the room in tears. I didn't sleep well that night. The next morning, I was up and out before Sandy even woke up. I had breakfast at a coffee shop near work, and when I got to the office, I did exactly what Frank suggested. I put the names of all six women on my assistant list into a small box, shook it, then reached inside and pulled out a name, Paulin. French was going to be my new personal assistant. Are the gods mocking me? Paulin is the only one of all the women on my list about whom I had masculine thoughts. I imagined telling her that my wife was also an assistant and then telling Paulin about how my wife took care of Dale and telling Paulin that I wished I had an assistant like her. Then I saw myself in a sexual assault case, and that thought quickly disappeared. Frank stopped by, and I told him I took his advice and pulled Paulin's name off the list. I would offer her this position when she arrived. He laughed and said, Keep it clean, Bob. I have seen the way you look at her when she goes south and the way she looks at you when she thinks no one is looking. You must be joking, I said. Just keep it clean, buddy. I wouldn't want to lose you over some guy's tail. He went into his office, leaving me with the thought, is Paul and watching me? Wanting everyone to be as happy as possible under the circumstances, I called all six women who had applied for the assistant position into my office and then explained to them that they were all highly qualified, so highly qualified that I had difficulty choosing one of them. I told them how Frank had solved a similar problem and that I had decided to do the same. I placed the deck of cards in the box on my desk and said, I've put all your names on the list, and to be fair, I'll let one of you make the decision for me. The high card will pull a name from the list and that will be the person to whom I offer the position. Marie had a ten of spades and reached into the box, pulling out a piece of paper. She wanted to hand it to me, but I asked her to read it out loud. She did so, and while all the girls were congratulating Paulin and no one was looking, I put a box with pieces of paper on which Paulin's name was written on the floor, and a box with all the names except Paulin's on the table in case anyone wanted to take a look. After everyone congratulated Paulin and went back to work, Paulin sat down opposite me and said, Do you seem to have missed something? What is this? You didn't offer me this position and didn't give me the opportunity to say yes or no. You're right, I said. I never thought about it, but honestly, you actually applied for the job, so why should I feel like I should offer it to you? I wanted to when I applied, but then I didn't know about your wife. What does she have to do with this? Maybe nothing. I don't know, and that's what I think we need to talk about. You interested me, Paulin. So what do we need to talk about? You wouldn't know it, but my sister works at Martin's in the same department as your wife and her boss, Dale. Pat, this is my sister. She told me about three months ago that your wife and her boss were dating. She found out by accident, she was in the back room getting a stack of copier paper, and the back room is separated by a fairly thin wall from the men's room. She overheard your wife's boss telling two other guys about a visit to A.L. Gated and how your wife took care of the guys from Amalgamated and made a deal that got Pat interested. She started watching your wife and her boss and said they often had long lunches together. So what does this have to do with me offering you the position of assistant? I was wondering if you expect me to be a personal assistant like your wife. Lord God, no. In any case, what my wife did destroyed our marriage. Why should I want this from you? This is very bad. Why? Because that's exactly the kind of helper I want to be. You probably aren't serious. Of course I am serious. When the position for your personal assistant opened up, I couldn't wait to apply. I imagined how we would go on business trips and sit in rooms with common doors through which I could come to you at the end of the working day. I imagined myself making deals for you so that you would get raises and promotions and become even more important to the company. I saw that I was doing everything possible to make my man need me enough to be there. Your man? Yes, my man. I saw how I could take you from your wife and then show you that I was ready to do anything for you, everything. You can't think like that. Oh, but I do. I don't know what to say, Paulin. No, that's not true. 
I know what to say about some of this. If I have to provide sex to get a signature on a contract, it will never happen. I'll quit before that happens. None of this will happen, Paulin. I am a married man, and as long as I am married, I will not cheat on my wife, even if she cheated on me. Just who? I am. I know this is just one of the reasons why I want you. It just doesn't fit in my head. On the one hand, you want me because I will not cheat on my wife who cheated on me. But on the other, you say that you will be promiscuous. You did not understand me. I said I would do anything for my man. This was the key, my man. My man would be my life, and I would do whatever he wanted. Well, I can't be your man while I'm married to Sandy. I paused, then added, and besides, I don't know you well enough to consider you as Sandy's replacement. Then why do you stare at my ass and legs every chance you get? I didn't say that I don't have a desire for you, I just don't know you very well. You will know me well enough by the time your divorce is final. Are you suggesting that Sandy and I won't work out? Unlikely, and for the same reason you mentioned earlier. Did you mention it earlier? You won't cheat on your wife who cheated on you. A man with such moral principles will not stay with a woman who stabbed him in the back. I didn't have an answer to this question, so I said, I'm offering you the position of personal assistant, Miss French. Please let me know your decision as soon as possible. You know I'll accept it. I need to be as close to you as possible if I want to have any chance of getting what I want. Okay then, your first task will be to find me a new secretary. Doris gave me two weeks' notice, her husband took a job in Boston. Talk to Doris, and she will tell you what my secretary should be like. I need more from a secretary than the ability to answer the phone and type. You know that any secretary I choose for you will be as scary as a mortal sin, right? I won't let anyone who even remotely resembles my rival get close to you. Just don't make her too ugly, a woman I really need to deal with every day to keep me from throwing up. We spent an hour discussing what her responsibilities would be and what I expected from her. I then began the process of moving from my office to the office that Dan Harvest, the previous regional director, had vacated upon his retirement. Next to him was a small office with an adjoining door, and it was there that Marsha Loomis, his personal assistant, worked. When Dan retired, he took Marsha with him, and they were married a week later. Paulin wasted no time in telling me that Dan and Marsha had set a precedent. What precedent? I asked. The regional director married his assistant. Dear God, woman, do I really have to endure this every day? Yes. I need to make sure you understand how serious I am. I shrugged. What real man wouldn't want to be courted by a woman like Paulin? But this will have to wait. Living in an impeccable state, I already knew from listening to the horror stories of friends who had gone through divorce what I could expect when I decided to make my own. It probably wouldn't be that bad for me since we didn't have kids and Sandy made about the same as me, so child support wouldn't have to be that much. As long as I stayed calm and didn't harass Dale or his employer, I would have to talk to Frank about possibly making me acting regional director and delaying any salary increase until the divorce is finalized, and then paying me the difference between my old and new salary as a bonus once I became a free man. The last thing I did before leaving the office was call the lawyer and set up an appointment. On the way home, I thought about what Paulin had told me and wondered if I was suitable to be her man. There was a 15-year age difference between us, and this thought gave me another thought, what the hell did the 27-year-old fox find in a 45-year-old man? Well, that answers the question I asked myself earlier. I asked myself if a 45-year-old single guy could attract younger women. Sandy was at home preparing dinner when I arrived. I took a beer out of the refrigerator when she said, now that you've had time to think it over, do you still intend to file for divorce? Of course I intend to. But why, Bob? Okay, I made a mistake and did something stupid, but I love you, and you know it. Why throw away 23 wonderful years? We're good together, Bob, and always have been. We don't need a divorce, honey. We can survive this. Just give me a chance. No, Sandy. We could just might get through this if you came to me and told me about the Chicago incident 
but I just can't handle the three months you devoted to Dale. It's a done deal, Sandy. I have an appointment with a lawyer tomorrow afternoon, and you'll probably receive the documents by the end of the week. I don't want a divorce, Bob, and I will fight for you. Come on, fight, Sandy. All this will bring you is debt. You can slow it down, but you can't stop it. We live in a state where the law is no-fault divorce. I apply, and it happens. I don't even need to explain the reason. I apply, and sooner or later it happens. In the absence of guilt, we divide everything in half. The house is sold, and we each get half of the proceeds and half of all other assets. I apply, you don't resist, and you get enough money out of the deal to rent an apartment and have some cash for a rainy day. If you resist, you'll have to pay a lawyer who can do nothing but slow down the process. There is nothing he can do to force me to stay married to you. I decided not to go after your company or Dale because as long as you work, I won't have to pay child support. When I said this, I saw a sudden thought flash across her face, and I cut her off mid-sentence. You can't stop thinking that I will support you instead of paying child support, but it won't work. What will happen if you quit your job or file for divorce is that I will either sue Dale and your company and use that money to pay child support, or I will give up the divorce, move out, and stop paying the bills. The phone, gas, and electricity will be cut off, and since I won't pay for the house, it will be repossessed. You will lose anyway. Face it, Sandy, you ruined your marriage. Right now, you need to think about how to make something out of it. This is a choice you have to make. Sandy, come out of this with something or nothing, but either way, Sandy, I'm leaving. Sandy began to cry and left the room. I shrugged, took the plate, and sat down to eat. Once finished, I went to the garage and worked on my Mustang. The next day, I spoke with Frank, and he agreed with my salary proposals. If I hadn't gotten a raise before the divorce, Sandy would have been making the same amount as me. Paulin looked pretty good that day and I began to think that I might have to change my mind and have nothing to do with her until my divorce was final. I began to think that once I applied and Sandy agreed, the marriage would be over, and I would be free to sleep with Paulin. That same day, the lawyer told me what I already knew, and I advised him to prepare the documents and then give them to Sandy on Saturday morning when she was home. After leaving the lawyer's office, I decided there was no point in going back to work for just an hour, so I went to Starbucks and looked through the daily newspaper looking for an apartment to rent. I found a couple, circled them, and noticed that I would have to pass them on the way home. So I decided to stop and look at them. They were nice, both had swimming pools, but one also had a gym, steam room, and large hot tub. It cost $50 more a month than elsewhere, but I thought it was worth it. I rented a two-bedroom apartment, paid the necessary fees, and headed home. Along the way, I made a mental list of what I would need to set up the place and also made a mental note to find a storage area large enough to park the Mustang and work on it. When I got home, Sandy was in the living room reading a book. When I came in, she looked up from her book and told me that dinner was on the stove. I heated up my dinner, ate, and went to the garage to fix the car. At 8.30, I went into the house and told Sandy that I needed to talk to her. We sat down at the kitchen table, and I told her that I was meeting with a lawyer and that the documents would be brought home to her on Saturday morning. Are you going to do this? Are you really going to do this? She asked. Of course, yes. I have already explained to you why it will be a fair deal. Everything will be divided in half, and our salaries will be approximately equal, so there should be no alimony. Each of us will keep our pensions. The only thing that will need to be addressed is the house. If you want to keep it, you can buy my half, otherwise, it will be sold, and we will split the proceeds equally. Don't you want to buy out my half? No, too many memories. I don't want to live with constant reminders of what happened before. I think you're being stupid, Bob. I love you, and you know it. We can work things out, divorce or not. It's not necessary. I'm sorry, Sandy, but I can't forget what you've been doing with Dale for the last three months. And you should know me well enough to know that I paid a deposit on the apartment today and will probably move into it this weekend. 
you need to decide what you want to do with the house. If you don't want it, we need to put it on the market. I got up and headed to the bedroom. I took a shower, lay in bed, and read until my eyes glazed over. Then I turned off the light and fell asleep. We'll talk in the evening, baby, she said in the morning as she left. As we walked, I wondered what Sandy thought we needed to talk about. I thought I had made my position perfectly clear. Her affair with Dale ended our marriage, that was the end of it. The day at work flew by. I had a surprise for Sandy. She said we would talk in the evening when we got home, but I had no intention of coming home. When I got home from work, I checked into the motel and turned off my cell phone. I had dinner at the Outback Steakhouse and then went to Bud's for a couple of beers before heading back to the motel. I had agreed with Frank that I would take the next day off, so I slept late and then had breakfast at the diner next to the motel. After eating, I... I called Martin and asked to speak to Sandy, but they told me she was in a meeting. I was asked if I wanted to leave a message, and I told the receptionist I would call back later. Knowing that Sandy was at work and not at home, I went to U-Haul and rented a truck and trailer to haul the cars. By four, I had cleared everything I wanted from the house. I left my wedding ring in the middle of the kitchen table and left. I arrived at my new apartment and moved in, then returned the truck and trailer. U-Haul also had storage space, so I rented a large space and moved the Mustang, my tools, and all my shop equipment there. I went to Dennis's for dinner and then stopped at Walmart to buy some things I needed to furnish my bachelor pad. I slept pretty soundly that night, and when I woke up in the morning, I realized that this was the first day I was starting all over again. Despite this, things started off on a sour note. I turned on my cell phone, which had been off for 36 hours, and it was full of missed messages and voicemails. They were all from Sandy. I deleted them all and thought about turning off the phone and buying a new one with a different number, but decided that would be too difficult given the number of people I would have to contact and give a new number to. Half of them wanted to know why, but I was not able to tell them about it. When I arrived at work, Doris was already there. She gave me an angry look and said, You need to call your wife. Since yesterday, she called 27 times and accused me of lying when I told her you weren't here. She says I am saying this only because you told me to. I replied, I don't want to talk to her, Doris. I moved and don't want anything to do with her anymore. When she calls, put her call on hold and leave it there until she hangs up. This gave me another idea. I went back to the lobby and told the security guard behind the desk that under no circumstances could Sandy be allowed into the building. He shrugged his shoulders and said, I'll log it so the other shifts can see it, but I can't promise anything. When it gets really busy here, people can slip through. Knowing that he was right, I said nothing and returned to my office. Paulin came in and said, Why do you look so sour? I answered her, and she said, Even if she gets past the guards, Doris, and I will make sure she doesn't get to you. How can you do this? I'll hold her for a while until you leave your office and go through mine to get to the back stairs. I think I was lucky and finally found a suitable assistant. Don't forget about it. At 12 o'clock, I called Doris into the office and told her to take her purse, as I was taking her to lunch as a thank you for putting up with Sandy. As soon as we placed our orders, Doris said, I'm not usually a very curious person, but I just have to ask, what's up with you and Sandy? I saw you two two weeks ago, and you looked great together. I replied, that's because two weeks ago, I didn't know what I know now. Sandy has been cheating on me for the last three months, and I just found out about it. Sandy cheating on you? I find it hard to believe. I don't think so. I said, I confronted her face to face, and she admitted it. She says it was just a short fling and that we will get over it. I, on the other hand, see things differently. What a pity. You and Sandy were so good together. At that moment, our orders arrived. While we were eating, I asked Doris if Paulin had discussed with her what to do if Sandy showed up. She said they had discussed it, and that was what prompted her to ask me the question. When we sat down at the table, Doris said, I'm prying into other people's business, but I would be careful when it comes to Paulin. I asked, 
why do you say that? She replied, when she told me what to do if Sandy showed up, I saw that she was already thinking about how to take her place. Is it bad? I asked. She's a damn attractive woman and smart too. Just be careful, Bob. Call it female intuition for lack of a better term, but I'm not sure Paulin is the one for you. There's something about her that doesn't seem right to me. I changed the subject and asked what Doris planned to do when she got to Boston, and we spent the rest of lunch discussing that. When we got back to the office, I gathered my courage and called Sandy at work. When she answered, I said, I didn't bother anyone, did I? She hung up, and I had to smile. She tried to contact me, I called and she hung up. I called back and told the receptionist that Sandy was too busy to talk to me, so I would leave a message for her. I said, please tell her to be home on Saturday morning and pick up the package. If, for some reason, she can't make it, I'll give this to her at work on Monday. This is important, so please make sure she gets the message. I left work early and went to the bank. The document Sandy was to be given contained information about the family's expenses, and she was told that she would need to save half of this amount from her salary. It was actually a good deal for her because she lived in our house while I had to live on my own. As the lawyer said, in a divorce, you always lose something, no matter who is to blame. I called and cancelled all of our joint credit cards and got the balance information for each one. I cashed in two certificates of deposit that were in the safe and used the money to pay off my credit card debt. There were six government savings bonds left in the locker and some personal papers, so I rented another one in my name only, took three bonds and my personal papers, birth certificate, passport, etc., and moved them into the new locker. After that, I had a weekend to look forward to and expected it to be spent settling into my new place. Saturday morning, I got up and had breakfast at the diner, then went to a couple of stores to buy a few more things I needed to make my apartment life more comfortable. After lunch, I went to the gym and was glad to see several beauties in swimsuits working out there. I noticed that only one of them had an engagement ring, and it occurred to me that the extra fifty bucks the apartment cost me was worth it for the view. This thought was strengthened when I went to the pool and saw all these beauties there. When I started swimming, I felt like I had a target audience that I could work with, provided, of course, that pollen doesn't catch me. Back home, I was making myself dinner when it finally dawned on me, for the first time in 23 years, Sandy was not in my life. It was upsetting because I really loved her. It wasn't that I wanted her, but I still loved her. I guess I always did, but I just couldn't accept what she did and leave it behind. I wasn't in the mood for it. I knew I would miss her in the coming months, but there was no turning back for me. Sunday was a day of getting used to my new life. I spent time in the gym and pool, and also some time in the warehouse working on the Mustang. Monday morning, when I arrived at work, Doris, who had been there for half an hour, told me that Sandy had called three times in the last fifteen minutes. I decided to end it and called her at work. The receptionist told me she had a meeting but left instructions that if I called, she should interrupt the meeting and call me. Thirty seconds later, Sandy was on the phone. You did it, she said. You really did it. How could you just throw away twenty-three years? I didn't throw anything away, Sandy. It's all because of you. Anyway, I'm answering your three calls this morning. What do you want? We need to sit down and talk, Bob. The situation is getting out of control. We have nothing to talk about, Sandy. You did what you did, and I can't live with it. Okay, okay. I made a mistake, a big mistake. But it doesn't change the fact that we love each other. We'll get through this, Bob. I know I'll have a lot of work to do, but we'll get through this. Just give me a chance. Sandy, you've been cheating for the last three months. The problem is, Sandy, I don't believe you. If I hadn't found out and made you aware of this, you would still be cheating. How can you get such thoughts out of my head, given that I know what you do? These thoughts exist, Sandy, because they were created by your actions, and they are not going away. In fact, every time I see you or talk to you, they pop into my head. Sorry, Sandy, but I can't live like this. 
I can't waste my time wondering where you are, what you're doing, and who you're doing it with. I repeat, I will always think about how easily you cheated on me after your trip to Chicago. I will quit my job. It doesn't matter, Sandy. I will still work, and since I won't be able to be with you 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, I will always wonder what you do when I'm not around. Keep working, Sandy. It pays well and it's more than you'll get in child support. I'm not going to give up on you. I love you, and I know that you love me. I know we can work things out if you just give me a chance. I really love you, Sandy, and I probably always will, but I can't live with you. I'm sorry, but I just can't. From now on, all contact between us must go through my lawyer. Goodbye, Sandy. I hung up and heard, life sucks, doesn't it? I looked back and saw Paulin standing in the doorway between her office and mine. Yes, that's true, I said, but it's still going on. May I suggest you have some fun? I make a great meatloaf and wouldn't mind having a meal with company. I thought for a few seconds and then said, sure, why not? I'll bring the wine. As soon as Paulin opened the door to her apartment, I realized that she was looking forward to more than just company over dinner. She didn't lie, she really made a great meatloaf. It was served with baked potatoes, French green beans, and crusty sourdough bread. We washed it down with the Cabernet Sauvignon I brought with me, and then I helped her wash the dishes. Paulin delivered on everything that was promised. When I was getting dressed, she said, You don't have to leave. I would like to wake up next to you in the morning. If I don't leave now, I won't leave you alone and I won't have the strength to drag myself to work in the morning. On the way home, I wondered if I would be able to physically maintain the diet that Paulin had promised. I also wondered if I wanted to get into another long-term relationship when I didn't even have the paperwork that would allow me to end my previous ones. As soon as my head hit the pillow, I fell into a deep sleep. The next day, Paulin acted like a true professional. No one seeing us together would even think that something was happening between us. Only when it was time to leave and Doris went home did she ask, Will you come to see me tonight? No, I do not think so. I saw the disappointment in her eyes and said, I thought since you cooked for me last night, I'll cook for you today. Every evening for the next six weeks, I spent either at Paulin's or at my home. Everything at work was professional and no one would ever suspect me of anything wrong. Sandy stopped trying to contact me, and my lawyer told me that she had hired a lawyer and was fighting the divorce. It can't stop it, but it can slow down the process and make it so expensive that you might decide to give it up. Let me think a little, maybe I can come up with something that will make her back off. Just when I thought life couldn't get any more complicated, I got a phone call that proved me wrong. I was sitting at a table at Duke's Steakhouse, studying the menu, when I saw Paulin heading towards me. I wondered how she knew I was here, but then I noticed she wasn't wearing the same clothes she had on when I left the office. Since she didn't know I would be here, I assumed she was seeing someone. Wrong conclusion, I thought as she walked straight towards me. She walked over to the table, and I stood up to greet her. Instead of just sitting down, she extended her hand to me and said, Hello, my name is Pat, and I can tell by the look on your face that you didn't know Paulin and I were twins. No. Actually I didn't know. Please have a seat. What can I get you to drink? A vodka and tonic and a slice of lime would be nice right now. As soon as Pat sat down, the waitress came over and I ordered drinks for myself and Pat. As soon as the waitress left, I asked, So, what is this really important thing that you need to talk to me about? Your phone call only said that it was important for you to meet with me about Paulin. There is one peculiarity about twins. They are either close, know each other's thoughts, live and act as one, or they hate each other. They may not hate you, but they don't really get along. Paulin and I fall into the second category. At first, things were different for us, but when we moved to high school, the relationship between us began to deteriorate. Paulin started to want what I had. Before we got to high school, we shared everything, what was mine was hers, and what was hers was mine. At this moment, the waitress came with drinks and brought our order. When she left, I asked, what does this have to do with me? 
I was in college here, and Paulin was in college in Ohio, so she wasn't around to interfere with my relationship. I met Brian and fell in love. It seemed to me that he loved me. I started planning my future with Brian. Paulin did not know Brian and had never met him. When she came home for the summer break between our sophomore and junior years, he was in Ohio working as an intern for his father's business. After all, she met him during spring break in our second-to-last class. Brian didn't go home for the holidays, but Paul and came home, and they met. By then, Brian and I were already planning to get married the week after graduation. I didn't think anything at all about Paul and trying to take Brian away from me because Brian and I loved each other, and Paul and couldn't do anything about it. I should have been on my guard, but I wasn't. Paul and I look alike. We speak the same and behave the same. If I hadn't told you that I was Paul and sister, would you have known? I mean, if I just walked up, sat down, and asked you to order me a drink, would you have realized that I'm not Paul and? I had to admit that I wouldn't understand. Then I asked the second time what that had to do with me. Just wait a couple more minutes before I tell you what you need to know. The history of what's happening. It was Tuesday evening, and Brian and I had a date to go to a play we wanted to see. I was a little late getting home and wasn't there when Brian arrived. Paulin was there, she pretended to be me, and she and Brian left. When I got home, no one was there, so I hurriedly got ready for the date and then waited and waited for Brian, but he never showed up. I couldn't understand why he left me. If something had happened, he would probably have called. I went to bed drunk and was already asleep when Brian brought Paul and home. The next day, when I asked him where he was and why he didn't at least call, he asked me what the hell I was talking about. That's when I found out what Paul and had done. I had a huge fight with Paul and about it, and she said it was just a prank. I couldn't blame Brian for that because how could he know? Everything settled down, and Paul and returned to school. Summer vacation arrived and Brian returned to Ohio to work in his father's business. Paulin didn't come home for the summer. She said she was taking summer classes to finish school early. A month into the summer holidays, I started missing Brian a lot, so I decided to visit him. I didn't call ahead because I wanted to surprise him. I was surprised to find Brian and Paulin together. Long story short, Paulin got him the date she stole from me. I'm afraid I didn't act very ladylike when I caught them. Since blood is thicker than water and family is family, Paulin and I eventually started talking again. She even told me that she was doing this for my sake and that she intended to tell me about it at the end of the summer holidays. She told me that Brian knew it wasn't me when he asked her out. I never spoke to Brian again, so I have no idea if that was true or not. This brings us to your question, what does all this have to do with you? I promised myself that someday I would get even with Paulin. It took years, but I can finally tell her this. And again, I don't understand what I have to do with it. Paulin has her eye on you, she already sees herself as your next wife. My goal is to prevent this from happening, and although Paulin does not know it, she is helping me achieve this goal. At this point, our order arrived, and while we were eating, the conversation stopped. While we ate, I thought about what Pat said. I thought of Paulin as a second wife, and why not? She looks great and cooks well. She's fun to be around and great in bed. Her apartment was always spotlessly clean, and she definitely seemed to care about me. It was hard for me to believe that Pat thought she could stop Paulin and me from being together permanently, and it was even harder to believe that Paulin would help Pat achieve her goal, even unintentionally. Pat and I both refused dessert, and I said, Okay, Pat, I know why you want to ruin Paulin's relationship with me, but what makes you think you can do it? I'll let Paulin do it for me. She reached into her purse, pulled out a mini cassette recorder, and placed it on the table. It was on the table between us. Paulin easily forgets how she behaves when it comes to me. When she comes to visit and has a few glasses of wine, she becomes very talkative, and I listen. I know Paulin and what she is like. As soon as she told me about her plans for you, I began secretly taping our conversations. This is a post from last Tuesday. She pressed the play button. So, how's your seduction of the boss going? 
I had him wrapped around my finger, Paulin said, laughing. What's so special about this guy? He's got money, honey, and he's going to make a lot more now that he's been promoted. I see a couple more promotions in his future. I'm going to work on Easy Street. Pat, I will live the life I deserve. But do you love him? I love it. I don't love him. All that matters is that I like him enough to put up with him. Would you cheat on him? Isn't that why he's divorcing his current wife? I'm smarter than she was. She set herself up to get caught. Bob will never know about Randy. Would you risk the good life you say you want just to sleep with your ex-boyfriend? We're great in bed together. Why give up if it's not necessary? So, you're going to marry this guy for the money and leave Randy? Yes. The best of both worlds, Pat said, pressing the stop button. Maybe you think she's worth putting up with the betrayal she's about to commit. Only you know. But at least I can say you were warned. I think you can. I suppose I should thank you, but, oh damn, before I met Sandy, two girls cheated on me, then Sandy and now this. What the hell should I do to find a woman who will remain faithful to me? She is somewhere. You will find her. I looked at her and smiled. How similar are you to your sister? What do you mean? I thought about dramatizing it. Paulin pretended to be you to get Brian, and you tell her you pretended to be her to get me. Let's say we arrived at the restaurant at the same time. I was surprised to see Paulin, and before you could tell me you were her twin sister, I suggested we skip lunch and go to my house for afternoon tea. You saw a chance to get even with her for what she did to Brian, and you took it. This would be ideal if not for one thing, I'm not like Paulin. I don't just jump into bed with guys, even to take revenge on Paulin. Even then, that's not what I wanted to hear. But I wanted to remain on good terms with Pat, so I said, okay, fine. I'm not the kind of guy who can just jump into bed with a girl, but Paulin doesn't need to know that we didn't do anything. I'll take the rest of the day off, and in the morning when I go to work, she'll no doubt ask me where I've been. I'll look at her in surprise and answer that she knows damn well where we've been. Then I'll say, was my performance in bed so bad that you've already forgotten about it? No matter how the situation progresses, Paulin will eventually find out that, as far as I know, I spent the entire day in bed with her or with someone who looked an awful lot like her. She's not stupid and she'll figure it out. And when she gets to you, all you have to do is say, remember Brian? Scales balanced. I liked him and I'm going to do everything I can to see him again. Just don't tell her about the recording. She's a very good assistant, and I want her around. I'll also let her be with me until she finally understands. That I'm not going to marry her. If you need a bed warmer, why not let your wife do it? She would kill for this opportunity. How did you know that? We've been friends ever since I told her what Dale had planned for her. What did Dale have planned for her? I know Paulin told you that I told her about overhearing Dale, Jared, and Tom talking in the men's room. Well, after that, every time I saw two or three of them going to the toilet together, I would go into the closet and listen to what they were talking about. I heard Dale tell them that he couldn't talk your wife down and that your wife left him. I overheard Jared and Tom telling Dale that they tried to get your wife to go out with them, but she refused. I heard Dale tell Jared that your wife told him to leave her alone and stop trying, or else she would go to management and file harassment charges against him. And that there would probably be a case filed in Chicago, and they would both be left without money or work. What finally made me reach out to your wife was that Dale told Tom that the next time he had a work lunch with your wife, he would slip her illegal substances, take her to a hotel room, and then call Tom and Jared. I went to your wife, told her what I heard and from then on, we became good friends. She knows she did wrong and she hates herself for it, but it kills her to lose you. I know what she did and why, and she really messed it up. But are you a saint? Look back at your life, and I'm sure you'll see times when you screwed up big time. And I'm sure in those times someone should have forgiven you. Why can't you find even a drop of forgiveness within yourself? She looked at her watch and said, it's time for me to get back to work. She opened her purse, took out a business card, 
and handed it to me. Call me on my cell phone and keep me posted on what you tell Paulin so I can repeat your story when she tells me about our afternoon flirtation. Then she left, leaving me with a lot of questions and no answers. I remembered what Doris had said about Paulin, and I wondered what she saw in Paulin that I hadn't noticed. I went to an afternoon session at the Rialto to kill some time and then went home. When my cell phone rang, I looked at the display and saw that it was Paulin calling, so I let the call go to voicemail. She called me twice more over the next two hours, and I answered the second call. After I said hello, she asked if I was home. When I said yes, she asked if she could come over. Didn't you have enough this afternoon? What's not enough? Come on, Paulin. Was my performance in bed so bad that you forgot about the whole thing? What are you talking about? I skipped lunch and spent a long day in bed with you. What else could I talk about? She was silent for a while and then said, I just remember that I promised my sister that I would come see her this evening. See you in the morning. Fine. Bye. As soon as I hung up, I took out Pat's business card and called her. When she answered, I said, you don't have to wait until tomorrow to talk to Paulin. She had just called and wanted to know if she could come over, so I told her about my day. If I'm not mistaken, she's already ready to meet you. Call me and let me know how things are going. I will. Bye. I figured Pat wouldn't call until the next day, so I watched a little TV before going to bed. I was sitting in bed reading Randy Wayne White's new novel when my phone rang. I saw it was Pat's number and answered the call. After my greeting, she said Paulin had just left and was furious. In general, she came as you thought and as soon as she was at the door, she asked where I had been during the day. I realized that she had guessed everything. I told her the story you suggested and then said, you were so good that I was thinking about having sex with you myself. I laughed at her and said, remember Brian? I think it equalizes us. So now all you have to worry about is whether I'll settle for equality or maybe want to move forward. After that, she ran away. Keep me posted on what's coming next. Next? Fine. I understood and said we could talk later. I smiled as I finished the chapter one was reading, then turned off the nightlight and went to bed. The next day at work, Paul and I behaved as professionally as usual. Just before leaving, she asked, yours or mine? I thought about making a joke and saying I had other plans that evening, but then I decided against it. I said, your choice. She responded that she would come to my place because she wanted to cook, and I had always heard that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. I just smiled, and she said she'd see me at her place. If I hadn't heard Pat's recording, Paulin might have become my second wife. This thought made me think of my first wife and what Pat had told me. I made two decisions, both of which cost me dearly. One would cost me money, and the other would cost me some time in jail but I had to do it. I opened the yellow pages, found what I was looking for, and made an appointment for the next day. Then I headed to Pollen's. The next day, Gavin Mayers from Spencer Investigations took my check and the information I had given him. He said I would hear from him in about two weeks. Those two weeks flew by unnoticed and passed quite calmly. I spent three or four nights a week with Pollen, either at my place or hers. It had been two weeks since Gavin Mayers from Spencer Investigations called me and said he had what I wanted. During the nights I didn't spend with Paulin, she was with Randy McComb. I already knew about Randy from Pat, but I couldn't confront Paulin about Randy without revealing that I had learned about him from Pat. So, I had to go to another source. I wasn't going to use it anytime soon because, as I told Pat, Paulin was a damn good mate, and I was in no hurry to lose her. However, I foresaw that the time would come when I would have to use it. The other information I received from Spencer was put to immediate use. I asked someone for a favor, and one evening, when Dale pulled up to his house and got out of the car, I made it clear to him to leave my wife alone. After dealing with Dale, I drove to the southern part of the city. It was an evening when Paulin and I weren't planning to meet, and out of curiosity, I drove past 343 Winsong Lane and saw Paulin's car parked in the driveway. For a moment, 
I thought it might be interesting to stop, ring the doorbell, and ask if I could have a word with Paulin. But I quickly dismissed the thought and headed home. The next morning, I called Pat and asked her to keep her eyes open for the next two days. She agreed and then asked me why. I simply told her that there were some recent events that might be of interest to her department at Martin. That same day, my lawyer called me and said that Sai's lawyer had requested a conference to discuss voluntary counseling, and if I didn't agree, he would petition the court to order counseling. I told him there was no way in hell I would agree to this. To end the nonsense about legal counseling, I would just go ahead and stop the divorce, just collect the papers, and send me your bill. When she finds another guy and decides to get married again, she can file for divorce. I hate to say it, but this is probably your best move so far. The next morning, as I was just entering my office after a 10 o'clock meeting, the phone rang. Gwen, my new secretary, answered the phone and said it was for me. I picked up the phone, and it was Pat. Dale came to work this morning beaten up. I compared this with your phone call yesterday and came to the correct answer. In my opinion, would you like to comment? Nothing other than to say it couldn't have happened to a more deserving guy. He tells the story that he was attacked and his wallet was stolen. This pretty much meant that my gamble had paid off, and the police wouldn't be coming to visit me. Thank you for calling. Watch your back. Fine, I will do so. I'll take care of it. Bye bye. That day, just after three, Gwen told me that I was receiving a call on the second line. I picked up the phone, said hello, and heard Sandy say, You still care. I know you care, so why don't you give me a chance? Because I don't want to get burned again. You don't need to worry about that. You know this won't happen again. I knew I'd never have to worry about it when we said our vows, but it happened anyway, didn't it? I explained, Bob, you should know that I will never allow this to happen again. I already told you, Sandy, that we might have been able to survive what happened in Chicago, but three months later, we became a stumbling block. I explained that too. Bob, there was no love or affection in this. Please, Bob, give me a chance. I know you still care. What you did to Dale proves that, what did? I do, Dale, I do not understand what you're saying. Bob, deny it all you want, but I know it's you. He's been beating around the bush since he came to work this morning. I know you care, so why don't you give me a chance? I have to hang up, Sandy, I have to go to a meeting. Goodbye. I didn't have an appointment to go to, but I needed to finish the call. Actually, I didn't care. In fact, I still love this woman, but I didn't think I could live with her given her three-month affair with Dale. I sat there staring at my phone, wondering what I had just thought. I didn't think I could live with her, but did I? No, I couldn't. This gave me an idea, why not give her the chance she wanted and watch? My thoughts were interrupted by Gwen's words that Frank wanted to see me, so I got up and headed to his office. When I returned to my office, it was almost time, and I asked Paulin whether she would spend the night with me or with her. No one, honey, I promised my sister that I would come see her tonight. On a sudden impulse, I went into the men's room, took out my cell phone, and called Pat. As I expected, she knew nothing at all about her sister's visit. I haven't spoken to Paulin since the evening she ran away from me. This told me that Paulin would probably spend the night in the Winsong Lane flat. I left work and headed to Bud's for a beer or two. As I sat at the bar, sipping my beer and watching the Broncos beat the Raiders, I wondered again if Sandy and I could do something. Obeying a sudden impulse, I left the bar and headed towards the house. As I turned onto the street, I saw Sandy getting into a car parked in front of the house. I saw her lean over and kiss the driver. When the car pulled away from the sidewalk, I decided to follow it. Ten minutes later, the car pulled into the parking lot of a Texas roadside cafe. Sandy and the driver got out of the car and walked into the restaurant holding hands. As soon as they got out of the car, I recognized the man. It was Bill Newbert. He was Sai's boyfriend from seventh grade until her sophomore year of college. They had a big fight and broke up, and a week after they broke up, I asked Sandy out, and we've been together ever since. 
curiosity got the better of me, and I waited for them to leave, then followed them back to the house. They both went inside, and after an hour, the lights went out inside. After an hour of waiting with no one coming out of the house, I headed back to my place. On the way home, I thought about a few things and decided to stick with it. My name was still on the mortgage for the house, so I had the legal right to do what I wanted. In the morning, I called Gavin at Spencer Investigations and told him what I needed. The next day, after making sure Sandy was at work, I... I had a meeting with someone from Spencer Investigations, and by noon, the house was outfitted with audio and video surveillance. My lawyer had previously advised me that without concrete physical evidence of adultery, securing a divorce without financial repercussions would be challenging. The only evidence I had was Sai's confession, which she could always deny if it served her interests. If Sandy and Newbert had behaved as I suspected, I would have had the proof needed to push forward with the divorce. Sandy and I were still married, so their actions would be clear evidence of adultery. I knew I was equally at fault but I wasn't certain if Sandy was aware of Pollen's involvement. Even if she did know, I doubted she would have hired a private investigator, she wanted us to reconcile, so why would she seek evidence against me? Strangely, I wasn't upset or angry about her actions. Ultimately, my relationship with Pollen was driven by similar needs. Over the next three weeks, while Sandy was at work, I would go home weekly, replace the DVD in the hidden tape recorder in the garage and switch out the tapes over the phone. I watched the DVDs while waiting for Pollen or on nights when Pollen and I weren't together. Newbert didn't visit every night, but about twice a week on average. From these recordings, I learned that Newbert wanted Sandy to agree to a divorce so he could marry her. Sandy, however, repeatedly told him that she only wanted to marry me and would fight against the divorce with everything she had. As long as we were married, I hoped Newbert would return. How could she be intimate with me if she had such strong feelings for him? I only needed what I got from Pollen. Bill, the sex I need, is something I only share with my husband at least once a week. Pollen would ask about the progress of the divorce, and I would tell her it was slow because Sandy was unwilling and her lawyer was constantly creating obstacles. I called Pat weekly to check if she had discovered anything new, but she always reported nothing. Your wife and Dale seemed to maintain a professional relationship, and if they met, it was far from public view. From our conversations, I got the sense their relationship was purely work-related. Pat mentioned that you had stopped the divorce and might have changed your mind. I replied maybe, wondering why I had said that. On Tuesday, Pollen planned to visit her sister and wouldn't be home. I went home briefly, recorded the latest update on the tape recorder, and sat down with a beer, listening to the recording from my phone and watching the video. The phone recordings were always empty, just regular calls and occasional ones from Newbert arranging meetings. The video showed Newbert was there on Sunday. After he left, Sandy returned to the bedroom, took out a framed photo of me from her bedside table, held it close, and cried. I turned off the player and stared at the blank screen, lost in thought. I didn't even realize I had picked up the phone until I heard S's voice on the other end. Hello, 